Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, you know, we're, we're having a little bit later of a show than usual. It's six o'clock out here on the East Coast instead of the normal five, hopefully. You see we're here, we're doing it, all the tweets went out, everything's going on. You know, but let me let me just ask you something. We're getting into that, that time of the year when you start having parties, you start having everything going on, you know. But, you know, if you think your parties are wild, today's special guest brings a crazy party. Some might say it's like a war. Please welcome Just Murphy to the Fitz Fun House. What's up, Skits? It's nice to meet a fellow Floridian. Hey, man. I mean, you know, that's just the way it is. You know, there's not too yeah, many man. people, if you're from Florida, that are actually born in Florida. You know, mm -hmm. that that's the one thing, especially, you know, I'm from Daytona Beach. It's a very transient community. You know, a lot of people coming and going, but hey, I was born and raised there. You know, it's just one of those things that you just don't find too often. You know, a nope. true Floridian. I got gator blood in my veins, but uh, oh. don't don't tell your wife she went to FSU, right? Well, she went to both Florida. <laughs> okay. and oh, Florida. she went to both. Okay, yeah. so she, wow, talk about divided. Interesting. Well, Who does know, she I'm, root for <laughs> in the games? I, I don't know. I, I mean, my family is all Florida fans, so uh, nice. they probably better be Florida. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so how are you today, man? How, how's everything going? It's going great, man. Uh, just, you know, doing the thing, working on the book and teaching school and uh, singing in a musical with my son. I do music theater, by the way. I know that's like way out in left field. <laughs> I did Jekyll and Hyde last year at the, at the local uh, equity theater and uh, doing another show with my son. He's a, he's a professional actor. He was on tour with the Bronx Tale. The show Bronx Tale was uh, touring. And uh, right. he, went, he, he went to like 40 different states. But, of course, it got canceled because of uh, COVID about two months in or two months out. I think he was on, on the road for about six, seven months. So, wow, that's, yeah. that's awesome, man. I, you know, and as I was saying before the show, you know, my wife, she's also an actress. She spent 15 years in Hollywood working and stuff like that. And she's still got her own uh, movie production company and uh, doing all sorts of little things here and there. So uh, I don't really know much about it. All I know is the little bit that I do know about it, I probably wouldn't like because it, it seems like it's a lot of sitting around and waiting to do things, you know? Yeah, yeah, and a lot of auditioning. I mean, we, we, do, of, yeah. we send out videos, audition videos, you know, four or five a week. So it's, yeah. it's very competitive, especially now with, you know, everybody's looking for work as far as actors go. So <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just one of those things, man. So tell me, uh, because I don't really know much about, yeah, I haven't uh, s seen you too much. on. I know you've been hitting the show circuit, stuff like that, but I've just been so busy working. I haven't had a chance to actually watch too many shows lately. Uh, tell me a little something about you. You know, what is special in your life? What, what really gets you bubbling and going? Uh, well, I mean, comics were always my first thing. That was my go-to art form. Uh, I've been doing animation for the past seven years on a film called Dogtown. It uh, stars Jason Begay, George Foreman, and Stacey Dash. Um, and that film's still in production, but it's an independent film, so it takes a long time. And uh, you know, I've been drawing comics ever since I was little, you know, little kid, six, seven years old. And uh, published my first book in 92, with Di you know, distributed through Diamond. Same time Image launched, by the way. Uh, so I've been in the business a long time on and off, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, I just love storytelling. That's really my main thing. That's why I do animation. That's why I do theater. That's why, you know, I, I do comics. It's all about telling the story. And uh, what I love about comics is it's the most affordable way, honestly, to tell a visual story. You know, movies cost a lot of money. Animation yeah. costs a lot of money. Comics don't cost a lot of money. If you can draw it, there it is, right? It just yep. requires some time and effort. So uh, I love it as a storytelling medium because you can explore things and you don't have to go out and raise, you know, half a million dollars or, you know, to do it, right? And you, you can do it for a very you know, minimal amount of money and a lot of effort. So. Yeah, if you're the one who's actually doing most of it, it's just sweat equity, really. You know, mm -hmm. you just 
get it and you start doing it and see how much you can do. And, and hopefully Seminole if you get her, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> <Seminole Langator. laughs> I know. But it's like, if, if you just get out there and you show people what you're trying to do, you know, uh, hopefully you can get a little bit of money to get it printed, or you might get a lot of money and make a ton of money off of it. You know, it's, there's, there's the bar is way like here and there, you know, it's just one of those things. It's like, you just got to work really hard and do the best you can. And a lot of people don't realize this. They're like, when, you know, I, I was contacted by someone who said, Hey, how can I learn how to do comic books? I'm like, well, do you draw? They're, like, no, do you write? No. It's, why, why do you, what, what are you interested in? You know, it's, just, it's like, it, if you're interested in crafting a talent, you got to spend a lot of time doing it. You know, I've been doing illustration and drawing and painting since uh, sixth grade, you know, and it's something yeah. that I just love to do. And I did it every day. And that's the only way you can get better is by doing it every day. You know, no, that's, that's something true. that it's just something that people don't really realize too much, or they just think it's way too out of bounds. Like they're like, Oh, I could never do that. You know, it, it just takes time and patience. That's really all it is. So yeah. what type of comics were you interested in when you were really young? What were some of the first comics you got? Oh, well, I've got some right here. This is a biggie. Uh -oh. This is one of my favorites. Oh, there <laughs> Actually, you go. It's more of a comic magazine. It's a uh, yeah. Savage Story Conan. Of course it was black and white. But uh, I loved it because they would do things in this book you, you didn't find in your average Marvel or DC comic. I mean, they could get away with a lot you know, more adult levels of violence and things like that. Uh, loved this book. And I uh, was a big fan of uh, Michael Golden's The Nom, the, the, that Vietnam oh, yeah. comic book that came yep. out yeah, in the 80s. Loved that. I loved G.I. Joe. Of course, I was you know, into G.I. Joe. I was in you know, fourth grade or third grade at the time. But the comic was so good. It was so well drawn and you know, you could read the comic and not even play with the toys. So loved, I liked a lot of military fantasy comics. Um, nice. Read superhero stuff, obviously Spider-Man, Hulk were two of my favorites, but superheroes weren't really my go-to. It was more um, fantasy, adventure, military, yeah. horror. Um, I don't know if you remember a book called The Realm with Guy Davis, the artist Guy Davis. It was kind of a Dungeons and Dragons type yes. comic by Arrow Comics. Yes. And I, uh, I loved that comic as well, yeah. another black and white. So yeah, I was kind of always on the fringes of the things that were that were popular, which is why when I published comics as a kid, I was doing a, it was a Civil War series. It was like historical sort of fictional characters put nice. in a historical setting, and uh, going for more of a niche market. But back in '92, you could do anything. I mean, you could if you put a number one on yeah. it, it would yeah. sell because <laughs> yeah. everybody was buying comics. And if it said number one, they're like that could be a collector's item, and they'd scoop it up immediately. They didn't care what it was about. So that was a kind of a a tricky time to get into comics because it, it it created a false impression of what comic the comics business would be because yeah, it was so definitely. successful and you got hooked on that feeling of lines out the door for you know i wasn't rob liefeld but i had a line out of the door at my comic shop in jacksonville i was like oh, is this for me and they're like yeah this is for you and i'm like 17 years old going what so it you know it'll never be that way again obviously that was that was a moment in time but I, I, uh, I got back into comics, honestly, because of what I was heard, heard going on with Comicsgate. And I was following um, Ethan Van Skyver's channel and, and following your boy Zach and hearing about all the things that are happening in the industry. And then seeing that there's this community funding these books online. You know? And I went, yeah. okay, well, there's, there's something to this. Maybe there's an audience now. Yep. I'm going to yep. tell you, 10 years of dealing with Diamond and 60% and discounts, <laughs> you don't make any money unless yeah. you sell high volume, you can't make money when you're getting 40% of your cover price. It's just, it's not, it kills a small publisher. It really does. So what I love about uh, crowdfunding the comic is you get the full price. And you'll see when I show my campaign, I'm charging retail amount for these books. I'm not charging, they're not, they're not, you know, any higher than what you'd pay in a bookstore, but I don't have to share that with Diamond, you know, or a yeah. distributor, you know, so it just makes more sense. And I like the, uh, the energy and the excitement, the community in comics gate and, 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 you know, not just comics gate. I mean, people that just crowdfund books, yeah. but I've, I've noticed that there's a lot of support and, and, and encouragement and everybody wants everybody's books to succeed. It's a great, you know, environment artistically to work in. So I like it. Yeah. I love the independent, you know, community, uh, you know, comics gate is a part of that. I'm, I, there's just a ton of people out there that are just trying to do their own thing and also invite other people in to be a part of that. And 
I definitely know because I've been in around the industry just as long as you. I mean, I, I got my uh, first job working at a comic book shop in like 89 or something like oh, that, nice. you know. So, you know, that was just something that I've always been interested in, always wanted to do. And I remember it was very tight knit, you know, like I met a few people back then, like one of the nicest, sweetest people I ever met back then was John Beatty. Uh, he was really big. Oh, as wow. Teacher. I haven't heard that name in a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, I had a teacher. Anchor. And, yeah. yeah. I had a teacher in seventh grade who was like best friends with him. They grew up together. So it was just. Uh, Actually, you know, wasn't he the anchor on the nom? I believe he was. Uh, I can't really he, remember. I know he did yeah. a lot of stuff with Mike Zeck. So, I mean, if uh, if Zeck was working on any of that stuff back then, he would have definitely probably been the anchor. But, yeah, I think he inked uh, over know, Michael Golden as well. So yeah, and he, yeah. he was doing a lot of the Punisher stuff back then. I mm -hmm. think that was what he really got big for. You know, Mike Zeck and and John Bay were doing doing that stuff. But he was just a sweet guy. You know, he he uh, came in, he did some drawings for me. He talked to me about wanting to be in the industry, you know, and, and stuff like that, and told me what to expect. You know, told me like, hey, not everyone are these big guys, you know. So get ready for that sort of thing. If you're interested, but of course I was only in seventh grade at the time. So, right. You know, it's just one we, of those things. We love you too, Verse Films. You love us, we love you. We're here you for you. We're here for you guys. You're our customers. We want to make you happy. So. That's right. That's right. So yeah, and also Michael Golden, he was living in Daytona Beach at the time. You know, he was working on the Micronauts. You know, so yeah, that was, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, well, you're, yeah, you're going back. Uh, that was yeah. <laughs> he did Micronauts. He I know he did a he did a little bit of a run on uh, Doctor Strange, which is still the best Doctor Strange art ever. Um, of course, his GI Joe yearbook was yeah. incredible. I remember yeah. seeing that in like fifth or sixth grade, like. What is this? You know, it's so good. I loved how he would draw vehicles turning corners and the vehicles would be bending. <laughs> like yeah. it's a rigid tank, but it's going around a corner and he puts like a cartoon bend on it. And he was so good with, with detail. Like in the NOM, all the, all the M16s were perfectly accurate to the year. Yeah. Their, yeah. their uniforms, the pouches, everything was researched. And I admired that because I didn't like that that sort of, you know, half-hearted approach you'd see in a lot of comics where they just sort of draw a gun <laughs> like some obscure rifle that doesn't belong yeah, in any you, period are, of history are yeah. you talking about rob liefeld i mean what well, are you I, about? well I, i'm talking no, i'm not even talking about the fantasy stuff i'm talking about stuff that was supposed to be historical and they draw like oh, a musket okay. and it's yeah. like that's, that musket doesn't look anything like an 1853 infield like like you know what i mean like it's supposed to be that's a musket in the civil war that just looks like a, a, a tube with a trigger on it you know, and that's just laziness of the artist. So, you know, I've always been into, like, even with War Party, it takes place in the French and Indian War. And, yeah, it's werewolves and, and shapeshifter skinwalkers. So there's a fantasy element. But all the historical stuff, like the uniforms and the cannons and the must, it's, it's all accurate. I, I do my research and try to put it in that world so that it feels authentic, like you're really in that time period and I'm not just, you know, slopping my way through it. Nice, nice. Well, let me just take a little second. There's a few people here that are in the chat that are like yelling at us, say, hey, man, this is a cool <laughs> guy, that's stuff like that. Let's just uh, go in here and say hey to a few of them. We got Black Star 13. That's my wife in there. She's, uh, you know, answering people's questions, doing, you know, sharing some stuff, whatever. Uh, we got our uh, Jelenian, Jel Jelenian. Ah, I can't say your name, but I mean, I. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. I'm terrible at saying names, but you're here all the time. I, I need to learn how to say it right at some point here. We got Burst Films. We got Mandible Smasher. Hey, Mandible Smasher, one of our biggest supporters. We really appreciate you. Statistical Zero. Hey, man, thanks a lot for being here. Uh, we got Eric McIntyre. Eric McIntyre is always here. I mean, a great guy, man. Appreciate him always being here. Uh, <laughs> well, okay, let's, let's scroll through that. All right, let, we, we said hey to a few different people. Now, so you started talking about your book. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. I mean, you said it takes during the French Indian War and all that. So tell us the the overarch. Give give me give me the elevator pitch, if you will. Okay. Well, the elevator pitch is it's basically a father trying to rescue his his young daughter who's been kidnapped. So uh, which just doesn't obviously sound like a fantasy thing, but. That's the gist of it. The motivation behind my character is he's trying to save his daughter and he enlists the help of a shaman uh, to receive these shape-shifting powers to go rescue his daughter because he's up against pretty heavy odds. Uh, he's up against the French nice. military, he's up against the British, and he's up against the tribal allies of both sides. 
And the reason why he's up against them is because um, once they find out about these skinwalkers, that they're real, that they're not just a legend, uh, they, they call a temporary truce. The French and Indian or the French and British army call a temporary truce to basically go after the, this, this war party of five. Um, so that's the gist of it in a nutshell. I, I call it last of the Mohicans meets altered beast, you know, oh, <laughs> you know, yeah, so there you go. I mean, that's, beast, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That was and, an awesome game. I had a Commodore 64, man. And I had altered beast on it. I played that thing to death, man. Yeah. And I've had people go, why did you make it in the 1750s? Why not just make it modern day? I, the mo because it's more interesting. I'm, I'm sorry, but yeah. the modern day is not that interesting, guys. I'm sorry. It's kind of boring, yeah. actually. Uh, you go back in time, and it automatically makes it far more fascinating. I mean, pre-colonial times in America was a wild wilderness. I mean, it was wild country. There was no rules in that war. It was one of our, the most brutal wars in American history. Men, women, children, babies nobody was yeah. was spared okay so on either side so it was a pretty nasty engagement um and so i was like this is a great backdrop this wild frontier america to put a werewolf story <laughs> into you know yeah there's there's a couple of really good films that come that uh take place during that time period which uh, you already mentioned one last of the mohicans and then mm -hmm. also uh the patriot i always yeah you know yeah. My, a little bit I, later I a little bit later, but the character, the main character, Mel Gibson, his uh, character, what they always go back to and talk about was the French and Indian War. Right, you know? and that's like, what traumatized him. That's the thing. Remember, yeah. he he opens up his case and he's got the tomahawk, and you see the flashbacks, and he, and he wants to free. He it's so horrible. He doesn't want to be in a war ever again. That's the whole point of yeah. the movie. But that just yeah, I've I've read a lot of books on that period in history, and this stuff will just curl your I mean your hair. It's like whoa, that's yeah, it's. It's it's rough, man. So, so uh, I was like, this is a great world to put this into. I, it's I think so it, untamed. I think there's also a Netflix series with Jason Momoa. It takes place during that time, maybe a oh, little bit mate. before the French Indian War, but it's all about that time because it has to do with the fur trade and everything. Right, right. So, Eric, uh, can I respond to Eric's? Yeah, go real for quick? it. Man, yeah, uh, yeah. Eric Michael is. Um, yeah, I had approached him. And I, I didn't realize he had done one for, for Johnny Phantasm until later. Uh, he is, he does seem like he's working more independently. But what you have to realize is these, these older artists, these more established artists, these legends like Michael Golden, they're so high priced now because of their experience. The industry won't hire them anymore. The yeah. industry, the industry's not spending money on artists and writers in case you haven't noticed <laughs> Marvel <and coughs> DC. Um, <laughs> Now, don't get me wrong. Jason Favick is great. I have three Jokers. I love his work um, and, and Jeff Johns. But I'm not talking about those guys. I'm talking about just your run-of-the-mill comics. They don't hire guys of Michael Golden's caliber anymore because he's too expensive. They don't want to spend that kind of money. So, well, yeah, go ahead. Also, a lot of those guys now, they just kind of do the show circuit and they do commission yeah. work. And they can make as much or more money just doing commissions and stuff and they don't have to worry about doing sequential art and stuff like that yeah you know, we, it's we work. ran in yeah you know we ran into the same thing you know we got kent williams on this i mean he's an industry legend and we got him mm. to do a cover and uh we were like hey would you be interested in doing some interior a couple sequential pages he's like ah, no you know <laughs> we're yeah. like okay you know but we appreciate you for doing the cover you know but that's just one of those things he's like man i love doing the cover for this book but, you know, uh, he makes more money doing other things now. Right. You know? so, yeah, and I but, don't think it's a lack of desire to do sequential art. I think they love doing sequential art. The yeah. problem is they were getting, you know, 500 to to $1,000 a page yeah. in the heyday. They're, and they're not paying anywhere close to that now nowadays. It's You know, you don't get that kind of money anymore. So... What, what, what do you think your run-of-the-mill uh, uh, comic book uh, artist gets nowadays for a page? What's the page rate? The, uh, do you happen I'd, to know honestly, that? I I'd, be, I'd be surprised it was more than $100 a page. Honestly. Are you serious? Yeah, oh, my I'd Lord. I'd be surprised. I could be wrong, but I don't think they're paying. Because, you know, that's why they're getting a lot of artists that don't either don't have a lot of experience or people they found online, you know, like on Tumblr or whatever, or Instagram yeah. or DeviantArt. Or, you know, yeah. there's not really it seems to be a pride in the craft anymore to make a great book. It's just get it out, get it done, let it be passable. I like what your boy Zach says. He says a lot of these comic books start to look like uh, the manuals you find in the seat of an air, of a airline. Like when you're on the airplane and it says, here's how you put on your life vest and blow yeah. it up. And like, he's right. 
they, you know, a lot of them, not all, but there's great artists out there. Don't get me wrong. But as you know, some of these books, you look at them, you're like, really? Are you you're trying to sell me this? Like, this is what you want me to buy? Seriously? You know, so it's it is strange because I grew up in the 1980s reading comics. I'm more of a late 80s kid than a 90s kid. I'm a Jim Shooter Marvel era, like sure. I said, nom and co. And that's really, I think, when the art reached its peak. It kind of in the 90s, it started to kind of get a little out of control, and it just it, it got excessive. But I felt like in the 80s, the peak of the, the late 80s with books like the killing joke brian boland you know some of bernie wrights and stuff that's top level that's top drawer stuff yeah um, definitely definitely so you're you're telling me you like marvel shooter not spasm shooter yeah exactly <laughs> uh yeah i i, I miss the gem shooter days you know the marvel tryout book remember you could buy that yeah it had yeah, like well, pages you can work on and everything well, he, was, he was really big on keeping continuity and, and mm -hmm. keeping everything in place where it's like okay we got all these stories going everything's got to fit within the timeline you mm -hmm. know so but it, it, they don't really seem to do any of that anymore which is kind of sad but you know whatever <laughs> Can uh, we go ahead and play your video? Yeah, go for it, if you have sound. Uh, yeah. Everything changed when war reached the Americas. Caught between the French and the British, my family paid the price. Only my darling Sarah survived. They took her away. We couldn't save them, but we will save her. Five men against thousands? How can it be done? But we are not merely men. War has brought out the beast in us all. And we will have our vengeance. For we are... The War Party. Man, sweet, sweet, sweet. Let me uh, exit out of that. Damn. Hail so mighty I, sailor. Sorry, I see Rick Sailor in the chat. Yeah. Hey, uh, <laughs> I, I noticed that you had a little bit of uh, Last of the Mohicans soundtrack in there, wasn't it? Yeah, fortunately, I haven't gotten in trouble for that yet. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was mentioning it. I hope we don't. You're like, oh, no, no, oh, no, no. I, it, it, I was hearing it. The music was all. Burr, burr, burr. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, it hasn't, oh, it, no. it hasn't, it hasn't, it hasn't triggered anything yet. So I think we're we're good. It's been played a million times. Nice, nice, nice. But it it's a nice trailer. So I'm guessing you did that illustration, uh, the animation, and yeah, yeah, the wolf yeah. transformation. Yeah, that's hand drawn yeah. animation. Nice, man. Yeah. That's one thing that I miss, man. I'm a huge fan of hand-drawn animation. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, it's what is there anything out there that's being done like that anymore? Because I, I really get annoyed by the computer graphics. To be Not in the honest. U.S. Uh, Japanese animation is still <clears throat> hand-drawn, still around. Because um, oh, the Japanese recognize like it. it. <laughs> yeah, they rep recognize the art, the artistry of it. America, as far as the mainstream studios, they're just about the dollars and they decided a long time ago, especially like with movies like Shrek, that CG was the way to go, um, just in terms of economically. Um, I don't personally like CG, to be honest with you. I'd, I'd much rather watch a hand-drawn animated movie over a CG movie any day, any day. Um, but hand-drawn animation requires training and apprenticeship and, you know, basically mentorship almost. Whereas CG, you know, you can hire several students right out of Cal Arts or, you know, out of Ringling or whatever. And just, you know, you do the hair, you do the rigging, you do the texture mapping, you do the light. You see what I mean? It's, it's a, it's a, it's a big assembly line of animating a character. Whereas with hand drawn, you'd have one supervisor over one character and they would do about 50% of the animation themselves that you see on screen. And then the rest was done by assistant animators and in-betweeners underneath that person. So yeah. they were able to really put themselves into the performance, whereas with CG, it's that's not really how it's done now. It's it's much more kind of just generic. Throw all the artists in a big pool and and give them all little uh, you know, assignments kind of thing. So it it just it doesn't appeal to me um, the way hand drawn does. But hand drawn requires more effort, and, and you know, and I just think that 
the studios just think it's easier. It's like why you see so many live action movies on green screen. Do we really yeah. want to build a set or do you just want to put our actors in front of green screen and just put the set in later? And of course you see the problem with that. Nothing looks real anymore. Nothing's believable anymore. Everything's just, you know, actors standing on a green screen. <laughs> it's yeah. just so. Well, some, sometimes it can look really good. Sometimes it can't, or most of the time it doesn't. Like, I mean, you get something like Avatar. I mean, come on, man, that, that looks amazing, Avatar. And they're it, all just in well, there. Well, it does, and but and I watched it the other night. I watched it the other night, and it doesn't hold up as well as it used to, because that was in 2009 when that came out. Well, I, you know, and we watched, me and my wife watched it probably about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Really? I, I, I thought it still held up. I was just like, dude, this is still awesome, some, man. some parts, yeah. I feel like the problem with CG is the technology keeps getting so much better that when you go back and watch older CG, it's like, you know, like if you go back and watch the original, like Phantom Menace, for example, or Attack of the yeah. Clones, the CG yeah. in those movies, it's like, Ugh, yeah, this doesn't, yeah. you guys have been better off building models and put guys in rubber masks. This is not, why is it that Star Wars is still holding up? <laughs> A New Hope is still holding up and this isn't, you see what I mean? So well, I don't know. I'm just an old school guy. I think if you can get it on camera, you you've won like, 90% of the battle right there, just getting it yeah. on camera. And yeah. then anything you need to supplement with computers, go for it. But yeah, they've just gone, everything's well, computer. You know, that, that, that's <laughs> what I really liked about J.J. Abrams' uh, Star mm. Wars, that, that first one he did. You know, he, he yeah. said that himself. He's like, I want to take it back to the original. I want it to all be as real as possible. You know, whatever right. we can't do, we'll put in. But for the most part, I want to just bring everything back to the real, you know, down and dirty. We're doing it, you know, in, in real places. And I thought it looked really, really good. Now, the story, another thing. I really enjoyed the, the story of it all the way up until it was like, oh, we need to, you know, destroy another Death Star, another big round ball in space. Yeah, like, no, re retread, come on. retread. Yeah, it, it was like, how many times are they going to do the same dang story? Mm -hmm. But besides that, I thought the movie looked fantastic, you know. Yeah, well, that's why Blade Runner still looks amazing. Oh, Blade yeah. Runner, everything yeah. in Blade Runner is models. Yep. Even the ca flying car is on a lift, and the lift is off camera, and the car is landing. You can't beat that, you know? Yeah. Uh, aliens, the queen alien is a puppet, and she yeah. still looks amazing. And today, yeah. they would have CG her all over the place, and it would not look as good. I mean, just well, in my opinion, it wouldn't. Well, they, they did do that, well, starting with uh, Aliens 3, which is why it looks so bad. They had the yeah, aliens running around, it's all digital, and it looked like yes. like dark shadows just moving around and stuff. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. it's yeah. like, come on, man. But, you know, yeah, I, I could I could do a whole other stream on, you know, practical effects versus CG. But, yeah, it, it is, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer in, in, the, in the traditional as much as possible. Um, I'll give it to Gollum and Lord of the Rings. Gollum looked amazing, but yeah, they put the time and effort into Gollum to make Gollum look amazing. And they yeah. used Andy Serkis's facial expressions and his acting. And that's yeah. why that works. Um, yeah. But you've got to put a lot of time into it. And a lot of the, the studios, they don't have the time or money to do that with everything in the movie. Yeah. So they're just throwing it, just getting it done and getting it out the door. And I get it. It's, you know, it's a product. But, sure, um, sure. Now let let's talk more about your book, man. Let's let's get a little bit into that. Uh, I was noticing here. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Talk talk me through some of this stuff. What would you say? I'm guessing this is your featured perk. Why should people buy this? Um, well, that's because you. Well, number one, you get eleven comic books and a poster for fifty dollars. <laughs> so why shouldn't you buy it? Is the question. Um, but no, it's it's all six issues, issues one through six. But then they also get five count them, five variants of issue one. And the reason why five, because there's five members of the war party. Okay, so each member is featured on the cover uh, of issue one. Michael Golden does the Eagle character. Uh, I do all the rest, all the other covers. Um, they're all autographed. You know? So it's it's the best, probably the best overall deal, um, it, you know, as far as my perks go, because you're getting a lot for your money. How many pages are in each book? They're a typical comic, so 22 pages of story. I know comics these days are wet down to 20. It's how lazy they're all getting. Are they? Are they <laughs> like comics 20? are 22 pages. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, I think some comics, even Marvel might be, they've gone down to 20 pages per issue. I'm mm. thinking, guys, how are you even going to, how can you even tell a story in 20 pages? Like, I can barely do it in 22. It's not that many pages. So, um, yeah, 22 pages roughly each issue. It comes out to about 140 
for the entire series. So if it were a graphic novel, it'd be a 140 page graphic novel. So it's a substantial read. Nice, nice. Uh, I, I love some of this art here, man. This is, nice. and this is all you right That's here? It's all me except the colors. I, I do everything but the colors. I have a colorist, uh, Jay Brown. He works for IDW. Uh, actually works on GI Joe <laughs> currently. Nice. Um, yeah, so I've been working with him for years. Yeah, this is wonderful stuff. Uh, I really like the like the trees and stuff right here. You know, the real gnarly looking tree. It's kind of like Sleepy Hollow or something yeah. like that. <laughs> or it's got the moss growing on top. You know mm -hmm. all about that because you're in Florida. Oh so. yeah. <laughs> that's something that a lot of people don't don't know too much about. You know that that's the dead. You know, talk about movies when they have a dead giveaway. You know, me and my wife, we, we do this all the time in movies where it's like supposed to be taking place in the deep south, but there's yeah. no Spanish moss on right, the trees. Moss, and, yeah. yeah, and, and no it's like, swamps. Yeah, no there's swamps. lots of swamps down here. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like, come on, man, this ain't this ain't Florida, this ain't Georgia. Right. Come on now. <laughs> uh, Eric, yes, it will be going in demand, but only if I hit my goal. Uh, I gotta hit my goal. I'm still two thousand <laughs> short. So um, yeah, I got to hit my goal. This is the last uh, 30 days of the campaign, so I can't extend it anymore. So I've got about two weeks left to hit uh, just over two grand. Yeah, we definitely need to get it out there, man, because this this book looks fantastic. You know, there's Thanks. it's uh, one of them things. You know, it's like, do you think maybe having just the individual issues? Do you think that might have hurt you, or do you think uh, it, really it, it, raised, to it? it raised some eyebrows a little bit because no one else is doing this. Um, I just wanted to do floppies, honestly. I could have released this as a one volume graphic novel, but um, I wanted six different covers. I wanted a saddle stitch bind. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted floppies. It's, it's really no more complicated than that. So I don't know if that's necessarily hurt me. I just think it's made people get a little curious, like, well, why is he offering floppies? Um, and they all ship together. I'm not shipping them separately so that, yeah. you know, you're, you're getting the whole story all at once and you can read it at whatever pace you want to read it. You can read issue one and then, you know, read issue two a week later, you know. So um, that's why I did it that way. So I don't think it's so much that. I think what it is is, well, number one, my goal is pretty high. 10,000 is not usually a goal that people set for uh, a crowdfunding campaign. It's usually much lower than that, mm -hmm. um, but it has to be because the amount of you know the amount of work I'm putting into this. Yeah. But also, uh, it's a very crowded market right now, and it's just it's very hard to get noticed. You know, I mean, there's a lot of competition right well, now I for mean, people's wallets. You know, and yeah, people can only spend so much money. Yeah, a lot of when uh, you know COVID hit and all that, it's like it really you know people started looking around. It's like, man, I need to kind of do some other things, do some other. and also because of the C, you know CG crew, you know they really brought a lot of eyes on it. So yeah. definitely a lot of people trying to throw their stuff in the water, see if they can get some nibbles and stuff like that. So you know it, it, we're definitely in. I, I think this is a good time because usually good things come from depressed errors. You know, whenever you have a depressed mm -hmm. error in the economy, if you can actually do something and make enough money to to do it in that time when the economy actually turns around and stuff, it'll do a lot better. You know, you just got to keep kind of turning the wheels and, and get it in there. Great but art. I, great art always comes out of pain. Exactly. Always. I mean, look exactly. at the Rena look at the Renaissance right after the Black Plague, right? I mean, you you there needs to be what did Kirk say in Star Trek Five? I want my pain. I need my pain. You know, like like you know, saying I want to take your pain away. He's like, no, don't take my pain away. Well, I mean, you can't write anything if you haven't lived anything, right? So uh, people want conflict and a, a certain degree of angst. They want yeah. that in their drama. And if you haven't lived that stuff, it's very hard to put that into your character. So, yeah, yeah I mean, it, it's, I agree, you know, that, that, that it can help the art, definitely. Cool, man. So I was trying to, there was something I was looking at on your campaign earlier. You had all these black and white pages here. Yeah, those aren't colored yet, but they will be. So you're still working on it. How much uh, yeah. do you have done? In, I'm on issue... Issue five is what I'm currently on right now. So nice. four issues are finished. I've been working on it for two years. So that's why I've got it quite a head start. I, w I wasn't going to launch this until I was on issue five because I didn't want to make the uh, the backers wait too long, you know, to receive their books. This would yeah. be crazy to launch this and I hadn't even started issue one. I mean, you'd be talking two years later, you get your books. So yeah, uh, I tried to alleviate those concerns with people and say, look, you know, the majority, I'm more than, you know, about three fourths of the way there. Uh, roughly, so um, you know, 
Now, do you, have any, do you have any original art for sale? I saw the one piece down there at the That's bottom. It. You know. That's it. Everything do you do else, it digitally? Yeah, every, I do everything digitally. I only created the poster traditionally so that I would have something traditional to offer. So that is a one of a kind. It's, it's 17 by 22. It's huge. It's two, two artboards taped together. Uh, that's it colored, obviously, scanned and colored. But yeah. at the bottom, you'll see me, you see me holding it. Um, the yeah, actual, actual Yeah, because I'm, I'm a big yeah. Uh, yep, that's it. Uh, original art guy. I really like original art. Um, so I, I've actually contacted some artists in the past. Actually, over the last 10 years, I haven't really bought too many comics. I've mainly bought uh, original art from artists that I really like. And every now and then I'll find an artist that I really like and I want to buy some original art. And they're like, oh, I do it digitally. I'm like, they're like, and then they'll say, do you want me to do a sketch for you? I'm like, no, I, I want a page of original art, you know, but. Right. Oh yeah, so. it's great. And I mean, that is the downside to digital. It's kind of, it kind of, it's kind of a bummer for the artist. Cause you're like, man, I, got, I have nothing original to sell. Um, but it just, it's, it's so much faster. I, I, I can't, I'm telling you, there's no comparison. Like inking digitally is so much faster, at least for me. I can't speak for everybody, but for me, I ink way faster digitally than I can traditionally. It's just, there's no contest. So, uh, and I pencil faster because it's just, you can make changes really quick. If, you know, if a head's too big, you can shrink it and move it over. It's just easier to make adjustments as you go. And I yeah. love digital technology. You know, it's Cintiq right back there. That's what I draw yep. on. That's yeah. what I, I keep looking over to right here is my Cintiq. You know, I got the yeah. computer up here and then the Cintiq right here. I've been working on a Cintiq, I don't know, maybe 12, 13 years or something like that. They're great. Before I that, love them. Yeah. Before that, it was just the Wacom tablets, you know, so. Yeah, I got off of those things as fast as possible. I said, I can't do this. I, I need my hand on the screen. You know, I need to feel like I'm drawing or painting just like I would on a canvas or a piece of paper. So I got I got off the tablet within less than a year and went and, and sprung for one of these. That's my third one I've bought, actually. So it's like third generation. But I first bought one back in 2009 or 10, I think. Yeah, that was, that was about the same one. time for yeah. me, yeah, 2008 or something like that. Yeah. And and uh, before that, it's like, you know, I, I told people, I was like, they're always like, why do you, you know, I'd, I'd get a new job doing graphic design or working mm -hmm. in-house somewhere, and I'd bring in my own Wacom tablet, and they'd be like, why do you work on that? I'm like, well, why do you work on a mouse? It's like, right. <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine doing drawing or, or graphic design working on a mouse. You what, know? what are you talking about? I love drawing with a bar of soap. <laughs> I know. I, know. I haven't had... I haven't worked on, I haven't used a mouse since the nineties. And even when yeah. it, once I stopped using it, you know what? The pain in my hand went away. You know, that's what yeah. I'm oh yeah. Mouse will give you a carpal tunnel in a heartbeat. Oh yeah, man. They're, they're, they're just horrible. You know, it's like, I, you know, and still to this day, you know, I'll go into places from time to time and I'll talk to designers and they're like, Oh yeah, I use a mouse. I'm like, how do you do your illustration with a mouse? I, I just, I mean, it, it blows my mind, you know, they're like, oh, I wouldn't want to use one of those things. I'm like, what? I mean, you grow up using a pencil, pencil and paper. So, I mean, it's so natural to use something like this, but, you know, to each his own. You know? Even digital painting, which I do as well, but digital painting is tricky. It's different because I grew up painting in oils, you know, with a paintbrush. And it's yeah. a lot different dragging that brush across a canvas and the way the paint interacts in the bristles versus using a stylus and trying to yep. paint, you don't yep. paint like this, you know? And so I'm waiting for them to make a stylus that actually has, maybe they have, has like fiber optic bristles, like a fan yeah, brush they, stylus, different you know tips and things. Yeah, there's a awesome. company that makes those. They're called, um, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but it, I'll remember it after the show and I'll send it to you. They, it's interesting, I've bought some of their, uh, some of their styluses before, but I've never bought the paint brush because I just thought right. it'd be kind of weird, you know? And also when I paint, I paint a little differently than most people. I think I, I do a, uh, I like being aggressive, you know, cause even when I do my inking, it's with brushes. I'm really aggressive. I'm just like, yeah. ah, 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 you know, I drag it all around. I destroy things, you know, when I buy my paintbrush, I buy those cheap ones at, at Lowe's or Home Depot. Right. And uh, <laughs> you know, the, the ones that you can get like four for a buck or something like that. And I just destroy them. I cut up Brussels the bristles. Coming out. Yeah, the bristles yeah, fall bristles out. Yeah, yeah and I, I just cut them at different angles to get whatever I yeah. want. But I, I just destroy them. So that, but that's just me, you know. 
I do use a uh, little bitty uh, paintbrushes though for fine work, you know, doing comic book type stuff. But yeah, it's just uh, it's just one of those things. I've always been that way where I've just like I, I want emotion in my brush making. I want mm -hmm. emotion in the in the art that I'm creating, and uh, and I think that's maybe one of the reasons why when I'm doing my inking and stuff, I still do it on the on the on paper. You know, I, I, right. I can work pretty quick. You know, I'm using a brush. I'm, I'm really aggressive with it. I know a lot of people, you know, they do all the fine line work and then they just trace over the line work. And you know, I, I don't do anything like that. I draw it outline basically. And then I just go right in with a brush and just like, you know, yeah. That, that, Digital inking has kind of made me do the same. When I used to do traditional inking, my pencils would be very tight. I'd get mm -hmm. everything right in pencils and then ink. But because of the flexibility of digital now, I just do my pencils look like sketches, like like they're not even you know they're really loose, they're yeah. really rough. The details are not there because when I get into the inking phase, that's really when I do about I don't know sixty percent of the of the drawing. I'm yeah. actually doing in the inking phase, and I'm just using the pencils to just lay out proportions and things yeah. like that. So uh, it's definitely sped that up for me. You know, I'm not doing the yeah. same thing twice. Yeah, I do. I do all my thumbnails uh, digitally. You know, I, I, I the, like you said, it's just way faster. I mean, there's no mm -hmm. point doing it on paper. I just, I just whip it out. You know, do it all digitally. I can move stuff around, blow it up, shrink it down, make sure everything is exactly where it is, and then I just project it out to a piece of paper, and you know, I, I throw the pencil down, and it's quick and easy. But uh, I, I love the digital stuff. I, I'd, I'd like to do more of it of my book skits digitally, but. I, I'm just one of those people. I, I want that look of a traditional thing. And even when I am doing did every, even when I am doing digital stuff, people usually think that it's traditional. They're like, Oh, is that watercolors? Is that you know, acrylics? I'm like, no, it's yeah. just, you know, I want it to have that look, you know, and that's just it. You can right. make it look like whatever you want in the computer. You just have to work hard to get that type of look. Yeah, you do. Or you have to, there's certain brushes and things that kind of mimic it and trick people. But I mean, you're you're right. There is an element. There is a tactile element to traditional media that digital still does at times have a problem yeah. you know, reproducing. Um, but for me, I, I I loved it. It actually made me love inking more in a strange way than, than yeah. traditional because I just love. I don't know. I love the way it feels on the on the tablet and and just how easy it is to change and adjust things. Nice, nice. So. Are you doing anything else uh, outside of comic booking? Is there other types? I mean, you do animation. Yeah, I've, like yeah that, um, the, there's a movie called Dogtown I've been working on for seven years, actually. Um, and I think I said before, it's uh, George Foreman, Stacey Dash, and Jason Begay do voices in it. Um, I have animators all over the world working on it at different points and different times. But I've had to raise the money for it as I go along. So Now, you it, know. Is, is that the boxer, George Foreman? Yes, the former heavyweight champion of the world. Yeah, that's wow. Have, have you been able to meet him? Yeah, I mean, I, when I went to I went to uh, Houston to record him because that's where he lives. So I flew out to Houston to record him in the studio. Uh, he's playing an old retired uh, pit bull, like fighting dog, because it's about dog fight, illegal dog fighting, and this dog's trying to escape from this dog fighting ring. And right. uh, I was like, "You're perfect for this, George." And he loved the idea, so I just wanted him to be himself, really. And yeah. just you know play the character that way well i think, I think <laughs> yeah <that's>, all his <laughs> kids <laughs> yeah. i think that's one of those things though it's like uh when you do animation uh, it, it instead of going out there and trying to find someone to fit it i mean it's like you know what people are like it, it seems like you'd want to find characters and put them into it you know it's like oh i got a character that's like this who's like that oh let's ask that yeah. guy you know and well, originally Foreman, i, I, I tried to get that. carl weathers originally apollo creed oh, himself yeah but um i just couldn't get anywhere his agent was like loving the idea and, and he just couldn't get him interested and then i so i was like well if i can't get a fake boxer why don't i go get a real boxer i was like george is a tv personality i've seen him do commercials yeah. i know he's got he, he's got the goods to deliver our, a performance and I, I just need him to be himself and i just contacted him and within minutes i'm not kidding minutes of emailing him uh my phone's like buzzing and he's like i'm in contact my agent. I love this idea or my lawyer. So yeah, sometimes it's real easy to, to get in, but to get, get these people. Same thing with Stacy dash from clueless. Uh, I got her through Instagram. 
you know, nice. I mean, I had to pay these people, of course, but, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and of course, Jason, I got him right before Chicago PD took off on NBC years ago. Uh, it's in its like fifth or sixth season now. He's the gruff and tough cop in, on the show, the lead guy. Um, great voice, gravelly, ripped up voice. Used to be a Scientologist, went around preaching against Scientology and how horrible it is. Um, uh, yeah, so he was great. So yeah, it's still in production, but you know, seven years doing the same, drawing the same dogs over and over again. As an artist, you're like, I gotta do something else for a while to just exercise my artistic muscles. And comics, you know, I hadn't done comics since 2008. I was like, let's let's get this war party thing going and get it out. So uh, yeah, I went. I went Disney. on. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's you true. Can't get him now yeah, he's on the men. No, I wouldn't be able to get him yeah. now at all. Yeah. I approached him. It was like four years ago when he was doing. He was doing nothing. So, so I, I went on a back uh, backlot tour of MGM Studios when I was maybe eight or nine uh, with my with my grandma and. Uh, I, you get to see all, how they do all the animation and stuff like that. And what they were telling me at the time is like they were doing every, they were hand drawing, but every third cell was hand drawn. And the ones in between they would do with mm -hmm. computers or something like that. Is that something that you do? Tell me a little bit about that. No, problem. no, I, I, uh, we do, <laughs> I have in betweeners in between. Um, the problem with computers is they can't really, I know what you're talking about, and that, that can be done. It's called interpolation. It can be done yeah. to a limited degree, but the computer can't always think about what the in-between is supposed to be, okay? Um, whereas the human brain can look at it and go, okay, the arm is moving this way. I need to put the arc in here and the fingers are changing. Like what if the hand changes angle? What if you're in between, yeah. between this and this is this. Mm -hmm. See, the computer can't do that, you know, because yeah. it, it's gonna in between this and this but it's gonna morph it in a weird way. So um, you still have to have human beings do that. Yeah. And it's 12 drawings a second, because uh, yeah. 24 drawing, twenty four frames is, is film, and you shoot them twice, you shoot each drawing twice. So it's 12 drawings a second. And in some cases, it's 24 drawings a second if you have to do what's called doing it on ones. So you're looking anywhere from 720 to 1440 drawings per minute. Right. Wow. They have to be. Yeah. They have to be drawn. Then they have to be cleaned up. Then they have to be inked and painted, you know, with the colors. And then oh. you add any shadows and highlights. Then you got to do the background, the camera work, compositing. It's massive. And so, yeah. That's why when people go, "You're doing a 140 page comic book, man. That's a lot of work." I'm like, "No, it's not. I'm an animator." <laughs> I said, "I said, yeah. I can draw a page in two days, and all of the action that takes place on that one page would take me months to animate. Months." Mm. See, so yeah. there's no there's no comparison in labor at all. It really isn't, even though comics are hard work. So I only have one little bit of experience with animation. Now this is uh this is gonna kind of throw you for a loop. Maybe it won't. I don't know. But when I was at SCAD, I took one class of computer animation. It was like intro to computer animation, and well, the way we did it is we did it in Director. Do you remember Macromedia Director? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So, and it was just like, you know, each page you, and you, you onion skin, you know, you do. Blah, 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 blah. And for me at that time, I was just like, dude, this is a ton of work. I would never mm -hmm. want to do this, but I took it to see if it was something that I would be interested in. If I wanted to get into that sort of thing at the time, they didn't have concept art and that sort of thing for movies and TV. You know, they didn't really have, that wasn't something that you could get into. Now, if they had had that, I'd have been all about that. I love all the concept art. I mean, a lot of skits is actually concept art. It, it's you right. know, got that look to it. But yeah, the doing all them individual cells and you were just talking about, it's like, that ain't me. There's no way I could sit there and do that. Yeah, so, well, it helps. It helps if you have assistance because what you can do is you do what's called keys and then someone else does breakdowns, which are the drawings between the keys, and then someone yeah. else does in-betweens, which are the drawings between the keys and the breakdowns. Um, so if you do it that way, you're able to move a little faster, and you're not, it's not one animator stuck on this shot for weeks. You know, They get their work done, they pass it on to the, the assistants, and they can move on to another shot. So it keeps, you know, it keeps it new and fresh, and that's why I think Disney did it. They did it for speed, but they also did it to keep sanity you know some of their animators um but it, it is an obsessive art form you have to get obsessed about yeah. the performance if you're not yeah. that type of personality then no you an animator you won't be an animator you know because yeah. it's it's yeah. tough
It's definitely tough. Have we got, I have a little question now. Okay, Rick Saylor. I would love some uh, to get some Mr. Sigenthaler artwork. Well, on the campaign, we are actually selling the pages, man. I got tons of pages. I'm going to have like 40 or 50 pages for sale. I've, I've sold a couple of the double page spreads. We're doing some big double page spreads, just like what you got, a little bit bigger. But, you know, we got those on there as well, and we sold a couple of those. We sold a couple of the, uh, the uh, splash pages, but we do have some artwork on there, so go check it out. And also go check out oh uh, Justin Murphy's man Professor Murphy here. I mean his original piece of artwork. It hasn't sold yet. That thing looks fantastic. Go over there and grab some of that, man. Next uh, in the next three or four days, also there's gonna be some new perks added. Uh, Preston Acevedo is doing an original painting of my lead character Diani on canvas, nice. and nice. I'm gonna be uh, offering 25 limited only 25. 25 limited edition prints of his painting. I'm also going to be selling the original and he's also doing five character sketch cards for me. Only one of each. So you, you, you claim the wolf, you claim the bear, the eagle, the gator, the jaguar. That's it. There's only one of each. Um, and that'll be up next week. So I, cause I was looking at my campaign. I wanted to offer more original perks. Um, yeah. And I've always, li I like Preston's work. I like what he's been doing for other uh, independent campaigns. And I contacted him and uh, he was all about it. He was excited about it. So he's working on that now. It'll be out three or four days. He said, "Be ready." What type of prints are they going to be? Are they like high-end prints or just low? -end? Yeah, they're going to be collectible, but not like posters. They're going to be printed on acid-free paper. And uh, like I said, twenty-five numbered. That's it. I'm not making any more. Nice. Um, and they'll get the full fifty-dollar pack with that with that perk. So you get the, you'll get the full variant set plus the print. Um, the sketch cards will just be by themselves, just a, a perk by themselves. And then of course the original, but, uh, it's, you know, selling original pieces when you're, when you're talking, you know, thousand dollars and up, that's a special class of collector <laughs> that'll yeah. spend that kind of money. I get it. I mean, those things don't, you got to find that one person that goes, yeah, I want this piece of art. Um, so I know that the higher end stuff gets a little pricey. So that's why I wanted to offer the prints, but make them limited edition. So they're still they still have some some value to them. They're not just posters. Well, you got to have different price points, you know, because you never know what type of shopper right. is going to come your way. You know, that's something that I feel like uh, certain campaigns are usually missing. It's like they got a twenty five, they got a fifty, and and then a hundred. I'm like, right. what about that guy who wants to spend five hundred or a thousand? You know, even right. if you don't sell it, you still got to put it up there. Give them something really right. really special. You know. I wanted to stay away from apparel and hats and shirts and yeah. things like that because I mean, I, I get it. People do it and, and there's nothing wrong with doing it. It's, it helps campaigns and all, and it's fun to do. But for this, I just wanted this to be the book, like the book mm -hmm. and some artwork. And that's like very streamlined. Here it is, yeah. which I mean, trying to raise $10,000 just by selling books is actually, <laughs> That's a, that's, a, that's a challenge because you're not selling hats and shirts and cards and keychains and you know, that stuff adds up. And when you're yeah. just selling the book, I mean, I think it's amazing. It's almost hit eight grand just selling comic books. So, yeah. <laughs> so we're getting there. We're getting close. Um, yeah. So everyone go on, go on over there and back this thing. I mean, this is, I, I think this book looks fantastic. I don't know if uh, we gotten any sales for you or anything, but I'll do it quick little reload oh we got a little something a little movement oh, right. yeah. hey every little bit helps man of course yeah um nice. I'm, I'm yeah so i'm just going to keep promoting it for the next two weeks i know there's always a bump the last week um the good yeah. news about this is it's going to come out whether i hit my goal or not i was the reason why i chose a flexible goal is because i was always intending on releasing this book um so you know the book's going to happen one way or the other uh, the biggest reason obviously to hit 10,000 is so that it can go in demand and people yeah. that discover it later can back it because otherwise they can't, you know, they can't, well, you can't pledge on Indiegogo once the campaign closes if you don't go in demand. Yeah, we were the same way. I mean, I'm doing pretty much everything. So I was just like, it's going to happen. I, you know, it's a matter right. of when or how or something like that. So we just had our goal is like 500 bucks. And I was like, let's just spin the wheel and see what happens. You know, no matter what, this thing's actually going to get done. And I got to tell you, like in our last day or something like that, we, we ended up getting like an extra two grand in the last day or something like that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's definitely possible. And ours isn't 
wasn't that high necessarily of a, of a campaign comparatively. So it's, uh, it's definitely possible and you got plenty of days left. Just keep hitting up the shows. I mean, what shows have you been on? Uh, pop XP, uh, Peter Samedi a couple times on his open mic. Uh, I love Peter. My, Michael Peter. Bancroft's show. Yeah. Um, uh, Mandy Summers. Yeah. Uh, who else? Um, Wise Guys, Mr. E. We Mr. love Mr. Wheezy. We, yeah, we, we, we call him Wheezy. Wheezy, yeah. <laughs> like I said. When we first yeah. saw his name, it, it, we yeah. were like, is this, is this Wiz Giz? What yeah. is it? You know, <laughs> he, he was like, Adam, oh, Adam, Adam Post been on his nice. show. Uh, Ethan right. gave it a, a couple shout out, a shout outs a couple of time on his, on his channel. Um, well, so he's obviously, yeah, yeah, he's been, yeah. Yeah. Ethan, I think shouted out for like all of 30 seconds. And I think I like, I think got like a thousand dollars in, pledges in uh, like thirties. I'm like, dude, that's power right there. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, Ethan, yeah, man, so, give me a shout out for 30 <laughs> seconds. Man. I, I need some of that yeah. love. <laughs> well, you know, if Ethan likes it, he'll say something. So it was quite a compliment. Cause it's like, Oh, Ethan likes my work. I'm, that's, that's, I'm, you know, I'm flattered. I'm, I'm humbled and flattered because, uh, oh, I know he only, he only shouts out things that he likes. So, yeah. um, it was nice to see that. So, yeah, I've gotten a little bit of traction, but I haven't really gotten on any big shows. Like obviously I haven't gotten on Ethan's. I haven't gotten on John Malin's yeah. or, you know, the Jack show or any of those things. Um, yeah. but I think when you're kind of a newcomer to comic skate, you've got to, you sort of have to prove yourself, you know, uh, even though I've been in comics since 92, <laughs> I still, you know, I'm still a new face as far as, uh, well, crowd yeah, we, comics goes. So. We're, we're all new online, you know, that's right. Just right. Thing. Now, now do you have your own, uh, I, I think, no, you, yeah. do you have your own channel, your own yeah, YouTube channel? It's Professor Murph. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't, so, uh, I don't post videos nearly enough as much as I should, but I, I post about a video a week. Yeah. That, like that was, the, that was a big thing. Like when we got started in this, we were like, okay, we're going to spend like six to nine months, like getting our name out there, showing the mm -hmm. artwork and we're going to try and build a channel. You know, it's like, I think that's really big. You know, it's like, you got to put yourself out there. You got to do it for yourself because uh, if, you can't rely on other people to sell your book. You know, you really got to get out there and sell it for yourself, you know, and right. at least that's what we think, you know, but I mean, we did get on a bunch of shows. We didn't get in on any of the big ones either. Really. Uh, we um, got on RGE. RGE was our, our big one. And then, um, yeah, we got on John Malin's, but not since the campaign launched, we haven't been, but, uh, the, yeah. And the these, chat these things help. It chat in the chat, um, Black Star Thirteen said, "You shouldn't have to prove yourself. Just be yourself. Sell a good product." Yeah, when I say prove myself, what I mean is um, things like the whole Red Rooster debacle, like when people don't get people in the past who haven't gotten their books or been burned by crowdfunding. Um, I think people want to see you uh, fulfill a campaign first before they'll yeah. back you. Like, there's yeah. some people that are like until I see. Until I know that this guy shipped those the books, I am not backing. I don't care how good it looks. I'm not backing your book. So, and I get it. I understand people have been burned, um, you know, because campaigns for whatever reason didn't fulfill. Um, but all I can do is say, you know, the work's there. You see it. Yeah. You know, uh, crowdfunding no. is a faith. It's an act of faith, right? <laughs> Giving people your money yeah. and going. Well, let's yeah. see if uh, you know something happens here. Now, did you get on uh, Dan Frager's show? We got on his. He his actually his show helped us yeah. out the most. Yeah, no, I haven't been able to get on Dan's show. Um, I mean, I'm in the chat and stuff like that. But you know, I mean, I, I've reached out to everybody, but ultimately, you know, you, uh, you know, it's out of your hands. I mean, yeah, if, if yeah. Got, all you can do have, is ask. Right, they have to invite you on their show uh, to some degree. So I'm, and I'm not saying it won't happen. It may happen, but I mean. Yeah. You know, there's a lot going on. People are busy trying to fulfill their campaigns. People are drawing. You know, yeah. I'm sure he's he's trying to get uh, pineapple perception, which I did back by the way. Uh, he's trying to get pineapple oh, yeah. perception ready, and and Ethan's busy with Rec Planet, and you know, I get it. it no one's under any obligation to have anybody on, honestly. Nope. And I nope. think it's a mistake when you get into this and you think, well, I'm doing a book. You know, everybody's supposed to have me on their show. Well, no, they don't. That's <laughs> they they're, don't they're, yeah. no. I mean. They're your healthy competition in some ways. So it's, yeah. it's, I mean, be thankful that any of us are, or, you know, anybody's having people on their shows because they don't have yeah. to do that. So I just appreciate whatever uh, exposure I can get, you know. Um, have you, have you been on RT Bears? No, no. 
Uh, you, ought to, you ought to try asking him. There's He's quite a – like I said, the reason why I'm probably not at 10,000, honestly, at this point is because I, I, I have not been on the any of the really large – like the biggest one I've probably been on is Mandy's show. Yeah, um, Mandy's really I, nice. Yeah, I'd say hers was probably the biggest that I've been on. Maybe Pop XP. Pop, Pop XP did, did pretty really good for me. Um, there's, nice. there's, there's delivered. Um, and of course, Pete's great, you know, but you know, open Pete. mic, you get, you we, get five we minutes. Pete. Yeah. You got five minutes on open mic and then you're gone. So it's, it's, it, there's not a lot of time really to, to sell your, sell your stuff. Well, Hey, if you're out there and you want someone on your show, who's got a really cool book, you should get this guy on the book, right. Or on your show right now and book him because he, he's got some really great stuff. It looks cool. It's awesome. And, uh, Give everybody your, your last pitch here because uh, we're at an hour and we always like to keep yeah. it at an hour. Um, well, I mean, this has got it all. It's got monsters, uh, high action, a little bit of a historical uh, fantasy, if you like that, and a sexy looking uh, female Indian, <laughs> sexy looking shaman. So uh, there's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's got all the things we used to love. Like I said, I used to love about Conan, you know, uh, great action, beautiful women, monsters, fantasy, magic. What more could you want? Right, exactly. you know, and a, and a guy trying to save his little girl, which if you know, if you if you if saving your child isn't enough of a motive, I don't know what is, right, <laughs> for a exactly. character. Exactly. You know? Now, I, I got to say thank you to everyone in the chat. The chat's been really busy today, and I really appreciate all of you being here. Uh, it's it's just great to know that people are willing to come over here and say hey to me and and see the guests and stuff like that. So. We really, really thank you. Thanks a lot for being here. Uh, Black Star has a, uh, this Saturday, 1121 at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. We will be guest creators at complex.com, uh, comicsplex, excuse me, <laughs> dot com, free online comic convention. Sign up and get some art. That's right. It's going to be really interesting. We've done a little bit of stuff with them. Uh, so go over there and check that out. Also, Black Star tomorrow is going to, I believe she's going to have a live show, a come get some live. So come get some live. <laughs> we'll, we'll be doing that tomorrow. So come check her out. Also later in the week, uh, maybe Thursday or something like that, I'm going to be continuing on doing some live artwork. So that'll be cool. And um, so, yeah, go over there and check this book out. And also, let me do something. Bam. Also, well, look at that. <laughs> also, check out Skits. I'm going to pimp my stuff a little bit here. Uh, go check out Skits, The Sun, book one. You know, we're the only, the only book out there that's got three books, three variant covers, and three variant stories. I mean, how awesome is that? Rap signed mm. and numbered in a nice little bundle for you. We got Kent Williams on one cover. I mean, I, you can't go wrong with Kent Williams. Kent Williams is awesome. We got Patrick Reynolds on another cover. I love Patrick Reynolds. I've been collecting his artwork for years. He's a fantastic artist. He also went to SCAD. We both went to SCAD. There you go. And then you got my cover right there. Boom for you. And just look at some of this artwork here, man. We've got some beautiful artwork in the book here. I love the this coloring is... in these books. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, everyone's always like, can. yeah, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, we do the best we can. We got all different types of stuff going on, nice. you know? Yeah. So go over there, check that book out as well. You know, go get your skits. And um, I'm going to go ahead and play this out. So thank you, everybody, for stopping by. Uh, thanks to my guest, uh, Justin Murphy. We, I appreciate you for being here. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Oh, I mean, it was awesome. I mean, I always have a Floridian on here. I mean, you know, you got you got to represent where you come from, right? All right. <laughs> all right. Thanks to all the backers. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, there you go. There you go. That's perfect, man. The, the old Gator Chump. Uh, thanks a lot for being here, everybody. We'll see you next time on the show.